This is Monica Reinagel, and you're listening to the Nutrition Diva Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. What do you do when you have two different health concerns that come with opposing or conflicting dietary recommendations? For example, how are you supposed to eat a diet that's both low in carbs, but also high in fiber, which is, of course, a kind of carbohydrate? Well, this week, I have some advice for those who find themselves stuck between two seemingly conflicting dietary prescriptions. But first, can a cardio machine change the way you look at fitness? Well, Matrix Fitness thinks so. That's why they've created premium treadmills, elliptical trainers, and exercise bikes that give you an exercise experience that's as unique as your fitness goals and all from the comfort of your home. So check out their lineup of equipment and change the way you think about home fitness. Plus, save up to $400 on the 2017 brand of the year. Just head over to johnsonfit.com slash matrix to learn more. I got an email from Christy last week. She wrote, I need your expertise. I'm overweight and I suffer from polycystic ovarian syndrome or PCOS. And for that, I'm told to follow a low carb diet but I also have mildly elevated cholesterol plus a familial tendency towards fatty liver disease. And for that, I'm told to eat lots of fiber and whole grains, which are loaded with carbs. So what should I do? Maybe you found yourself in a dilemma similar to Christie's, where dietary recommendations for one health concern directly conflict with the dietary advice for another. For example, I remember getting an email a few years back from a woman who had both IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, and diverticulosis, and she was wondering about her doctor's advice to eat a high-fiber diet, because while that can certainly help with diverticulosis, she knew that it could make IBS worse. Well, in some cases, your best bet may be to work with a nutrition professional one-on-one who can not only help you sort through and reconcile conflicting recommendations, but they can also help you translate those into practical solutions like meal plans and shopping lists. That was definitely my recommendation for the woman who had both IBS and diverticulosis. And it might also be a good idea for Christy, but I think I can help resolve at least some of Christy's dilemma because the recommendations to increase fiber and decrease carbohydrates may not be as contradictory as it seems. It helps to understand the rationale underlying these recommendations. So let's start by taking a closer look at the idea that people with PCOS need a low-carb diet. Now, I did an episode on PCOS not too long ago, and in that show, I talked about the fact that people with this condition are more likely to have some degree of insulin resistance, meaning that they have trouble managing their blood sugar. Going on a strict, low-carbohydrate diet is one way to deal with insulin resistance, but it's not the only way. I prefer a less drastic approach where we focus on reducing those carbs that are doing the most damage and contributing the least nutrition, but we try to avoid throwing the baby out with the bathwater. First, you would want to eliminate sweetened beverages, fruit juice, candies, pastries, desserts, and other things that are made with sugar and white flour. These are high glycemic carbohydrates, That means that they're quickly digested and absorbed into the bloodstream. Eating a lot of high glycemic carbs when you have insulin resistance or blood sugar issues is like pouring gasoline on a fire. Other more nutritious sources of carbohydrates, such as whole fruit, dairy products, legumes, and whole grains, they're not high glycemic foods, but they're not exactly low glycemic either. They can certainly be included in your diet. The trick is to consume them in moderation. So, for example, while whole grains are a better choice than refined grains, you still might limit your consumption of whole grain foods to just a couple of servings per day. Non-starchy vegetables are almost 100% carbohydrate, but these are very low glycemic carbs, not to mention nutritional superstars. No need to limit them. Okay, so just to review, you're going to largely eliminate high glycemic carbs, like sweetened beverages, desserts, white bread, and other things made with white flour. 
you're going to moderate your intake of moderate glycemic carbs, like whole fruit, dairy, legumes, and whole grain foods, and you're going to load up on low glycemic carbohydrates like non-starchy vegetables. So far, so good. Now, before we switch gears and look at the dietary recommendations for high cholesterol, let me just take a moment to thank our other sponsor, Care Of. Nutritional supplements can help ensure that you're meeting your body's nutritional needs. But as you probably know, I favor a targeted approach where you take only the nutrients that you actually need, as opposed to a scattershot kitchen sink, one size fits all approach. And that's what I like about Care Of. They make it easy to design a customized regimen. You answer a few short questions about your diet and lifestyle on their website, and they'll make sensible recommendations, and they'll even link you to the research supporting their recommendations. Once you have your regimen adjusted to your liking, Care Of sends daily packs personalized for you right to your door. You know, I have a bad habit of forgetting to take my supplements and having that convenient dispenser right next to the coffee machine means that I have a much better track record. And it's also super convenient when I'm traveling. I just grab one packet for each day that I'm going to be away and I'm good to go. And you actually save money by getting your vitamins through care of rather than your local health food store. Go to takecareof.com and get your personalized recommendation today. Plus get $10 off your first order when you use the code DIVA. That's takecareof.com and the offer code is DIVA for $10 off your first order. Now let's take a look at the dietary recommendations for high cholesterol and or fatty liver disease. Both of these conditions benefit from a diet that's higher in fiber, and a good goal would be 25 to 30 grams of fiber per day. Soluble fiber, in particular, reduces the amount of fat and cholesterol that's absorbed from the food you eat and processed by your liver. And sure enough, eating foods that are high in soluble fiber, such as oats and legumes, can help lower your LDL cholesterol levels. But this may not all be due to the fiber. These foods also happen to contain phytosterols, which I just talked about in a recent episode on corn oil. As you may recall from that show, phytosterols are plant compounds that work to block absorption of cholesterol from foods by occupying the cellular parking spots where cholesterol would normally park. And in the show notes, I have a link to an article that includes a chart that lists the phytosterol content of many foods, if you're interested in that. The good news is that you can get all the fiber you need without overloading on carbs. A bowl of high-fiber cereal for breakfast, a cup of black bean soup for lunch, some fresh fruits and vegetables along the way, and you're there. Now, although whole grain breads have more fiber than their white flour counterparts, they do have a somewhat undeserved reputation for being high in fiber. Other foods, such as legumes, bran, avocados, artichokes, broccoli, and berries, are even better sources of fiber, and they're lower in carbs. Finally, it's worth pointing out that all of the conditions that we've been talking about today, PCOS, insulin resistance, fatty liver, and high cholesterol, they generally improve when you lose weight. Any diet that helps you shed excess pounds should help, even if it's not particularly low in carbohydrates or high in fiber. As it happens, however, the low glycemic, moderate carb diet that we've just outlined is also really good for weight loss because those low to moderate glycemic foods help to quell your appetite. Hey, if you're looking for a fun way to upgrade your diet and your nutrition, we are kicking off another 30-day nutrition upgrade group challenge in two weeks on March 13th, and I would love to have you join us. These are always so much fun, and the results last a lot longer than 30 days. You'll find more details on my website at nutritionovereasy.com, or you're welcome to shoot me an email at monica at nutritionovereasy.com, and I will be happy to send you all the details. You're also welcome to email me with a nutrition question or a dilemma that you'd like me to tackle in a future podcast. And then be sure you're subscribed to the Nutrition Diva podcast so you don't miss a single episode. You'll find a transcript of today's show, along with the complete archives of all 419 episodes of the Nutrition Diva podcast at quickanddirtytips.com. Thanks for listening and have a great week.